Developing right now on Morning News Now, an Israeli incursion underway in Lebanon. Overnight, Israel launching what it calls limited, localized, and targeted ground operations aimed at Hezbollah. The expanded offensive coming just days after the killing of a powerful Hezbollah leader. Lebanon, the region, the world are safer without him. Diplomacy remains the best and only path to achieving greater stability in the Middle East. We'll bring you the latest from a region on the edge. Also this morning, parts of the South picking up the pieces from Hurricane Helene as both presidential hopefuls vow to help with recovery efforts. And the stage is set for the first and possibly only vice presidential debate between Minnesota Governor Tim Walz and Senator J.D. Vance. We have team coverage. Plus, port workers on the picket line stretching across the East and Gulf Coast in a strike that could cripple America's shipping industry during the busy holiday shopping season. And presidential centennial former President Jimmy Carter turns 100 today. We'll look back at his decades of service to the country and the historic celebration to honor him. 100. No I'm kidding. I visited the Carter Library oh, recently. Yeah. It's just incredible to see not just what he accomplished during his presidency, but how much he's accomplished after that. We'll take a look it's at incredible. all of it. Coming Absolutely. Up. Good to have you with us this morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin today with the latest from the Middle East. Israeli soldiers have started what the IDF is calling, quote, limited, localized, and targeted ground operations against Hezbollah inside Lebanon. Israeli officials notified the U.S. that the operations would be limited in scope and duration. The IDF says the incursion is meant to protect Israeli citizens who live along the border with Lebanon. In a statement, Hezbollah said it was targeting Israeli troops in northern Israel with rockets. Sirens sounded in Tel Aviv after what the IDF called projectile launches that crossed from Lebanon were intercepted. Ground invasion is the latest escalation in the ongoing conflict between the two sides, a conflict that has rattled Lebanon in recent weeks. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from the Lebanese capital with the latest. Matt, good morning. Let's start with the latest on the ground. Tell us more about the current situation in southern Lebanon. What kind of operations are Israeli forces conducting and how is Hezbollah responding? Well, the short answer to that, Joe, is I don't know. But as you said in your introduction, this could be so limited, so localized, so targeted, to borrow the IDF's language, that almost that Hezbollah might not have even noticed. In fact, they went so far as today to call all of this a lie. They said that, has, that Israelis uh, had not actually penetrated the border, that this was Zionist propaganda, and that they hadn't exchanged fire with the Israelis. Now, that's all very possible. We heard from Reuters, who was quoting a security official in the Israeli security establishment, saying that they had not, the Israelis had not exchanged fire with Hezbollah. So in a way, it almost looks as though this incursion looked a lot like what we've been seeing over the past couple of days or what we just heard about yesterday when the Israelis come out, came out and admitted that they had already been sending troops across the border on reconnaissance missions. We don't know really, we don't have any details at this early hour for exactly how last night's raids or incursions or invasion, whatever language you choose to use here, whether that's different from what we've been hearing about has been happening over the past couple of days. But so far, it sounds as though it has been, again, to use the Israelis' words, very, very limited. They said, according to Reuters, that they have only penetrated so far across Lebanon as to be still within walking distance of the border. And the Israelis also told Reuters that they were not planning on launching a ground invasion as far north as where I am right now, Beirut, Lebanon's capital, that that was, quote, off the table. So we really don't know much about last night's operation. We don't know exactly what happened. We don't know if Israeli troops simply went in and left or if they're still actually within Lebanese borders. This is something that we're going to be getting in the next couple of hours and days. And all of that is going to determine what happens next in this conflict. But so far, the real issue here, guys, is still the air to ground attacks that Israel has been using pounding Hezbollah targets across the country and here in Dahia, just off my right shoulder in the southern district of Beirut. That has been used to great effect by the Israelis to cripple Hezbollah, to decapitate their leadership and to really put them on the back foot as it looks like the entire world is trying to figure out what Israel and what Hezbollah and crucially what Iran is going to do next in this expanding conflict. Guys. So, Matt, with the stated goal of making it safe for Israelis in the north of the country near that Lebanese border, 
it, making it safe enough for them to go home. Are the kind of limited operations they say they are conducting and they say they will restrict themselves to enough to achieve that? Well, it, if you're talking about, as, you know, and this is not our own reporting. This is what we heard from Reuters, quoting a security source within the Israeli security establishment. If that's true, if last night's operation only went so far as to be within walking distance of the Lebanese-Israeli border, if they didn't exchange fire with any Hezbollah commandos, then the, the obvious answer is no. They're not actually doing much in order to push back the Hezbollah from beyond their range of artillery and missile fire. That is the critical thing, and that's the stated objective that we've been hearing the Israelis saying for the past several weeks. They want to make sure that they can return their populations in the north of Israel back to their homes, tens of thousands of people. That's the stated objective of this operation. Now, if what we saw last night was the extent of that, they probably haven't achieved it. But the thing, as I'm saying, that they've been using to great effect are these airstrikes. And that has gone quite a long way. Guys? All right, Matt Bradley, Matt, thank you so much. Now let's get to our other big story of the morning. Hurricane Helene's unprecedented path of destruction causing historic flooding, demolishing entire neighborhoods. The storm killed at least 125 people and it's left many others unaccounted for. The scope of the widespread devastation is still just coming into focus. Rescue crews are finally starting to access remote areas in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina, places that were too tough to reach because the roads are either littered with debris or washed away entirely. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson is in Irwin, Tennessee. She joins us with the latest. Priscilla, good morning. While we are still getting a sense of the scope of the damage out there, there are dozens of people who are unaccounted for, maybe hundreds. What's the latest you're hearing from officials? Yeah, Savannah, good morning. Overnight, officials here updated that there are now little over 100 people who are still unaccounted for. That number is down from 150 as of yesterday. But they did also increase the death toll from three people yesterday to now six people confirmed dead as a result of this storm. Uh, officials here say that there are 100 responders who are on the ground still searching through this debris for any signs of life. But they say that at this point, this has become a search and recovery mission. They are no longer looking at search and rescue. And they are saying that this is a painstaking process because as they find remains, they want to ensure that those are storm-related deaths and not something else. And so just letting people know who are out there missing relatives, missing loved ones, that this will take time. And we also have learned that the governor of Tennessee is expected to be on the ground today to survey the damage and provide an update as well. Savannah, Priscilla, Joe. Priscilla, we're seeing so many dramatic images from where you are that includes people being rescued from a hospital roof there that was just surrounded by floodwaters tell us more about what happened there yeah, and that hospital is actually right across the street from us. And I spoke to the chief medical officer. He was the last person to be evacuated from that rooftop. And he says that originally they had planned to hunker down. But as they saw how quickly the water was re rising, he realized that he had to get folks out. And so he called the governor in order to get those choppers here. And um, take a listen to how he described the scene. There were literally flowing rapids, probably a uh, six inches to a half a foot to a foot high flowing within the building and um every every team member even with that we're pushing those gurneys to get them out through the doors to get them back into an eddy behind the hospital and that's where we use ladders from the fire truck to get on the roof because so you our, all hoisted those patients onto the roof yes ma'am yes we did some of us carried individual patients on our backs we just didn't know how much time we had and they were able to save more than 60 people in that rescue. But unfortunately, the chief medical officer says that now there are members of their staff and their team that are currently unaccounted for. Joe, Savannah. Priscilla, I also want to ask you, uh, it's a company called Impact Plastics. We understand several of its employees at a plant there in Irwin where you are. They were killed and many are still missing. What can you tell us? Yeah, so Impact Plastics says that there were folks working at their factory, and as the roadway and the parking lot began to flood, they dismissed those employees, but they say that there were some employees that for some reason stayed on the property, and as the water began uh, to rise, they ended up trapped inside of a semi-truck, and that that semi-truck tipped 
over. And so there were five people who were able to be rescued by Chopper, but there were six people who went missing and have not yet been found. And we saw some of those family members at a press conference yesterday holding up photos of their loved ones, begging for answers. And of course, that death toll was updated overnight. So it is possible that some of those families may have gotten those answers. Many of them believed that their loved ones did, in fact, uh, pass away from that tragic flooding. Joe, Savannah. Priscilla Thompson, thank you so much for your reporting here. Let's bring in Jay Carter, who's currently in another hard hit area, Western North Carolina. He's the CEO of Halo Relief. That's a volunteer organization helping bring supplies to people impacted by the damage. Jay, I know you're busy, so thank you for your time this morning. I mean, we have seen this morning and have seen for days all the devastating video from that area. But you being there on the ground and having helped in past disasters, give us a sense of what you're seeing. And does it compare to anything you've ever seen before? Mm -hmm. Well, sir, we started with Pauline in Florida. We traveled with the storm up through Florida, through Georgia, South Carolina, and into North Carolina now. Um, but it's it's left a lot of devastation in its past. It really is. Tell us about some of the things that you need. And if someone is looking to donate, how can somebody do that? What supplies should they be donating to people in these hard-hit areas? Uh, well, you can go to halorelief.org and get our Facebook pages, click the link, and go to area recovery as well. Um, there's a place to donate. There's a place to volunteer. Um, you can get requests for help, stuff like that. <clears throat> go to those pages, and they'll guide you to uh, to whichever link you need. Um, we need things like, obviously, food and water. Um, generators are a big help out here right now. There's no power in a lot of these towns we visited, obviously. Um, and then something I didn't think about that kind of caught me off guard yesterday, we worked with a uh, elderly gentleman and he said at night that the blankets just weren't enough, you know, mm. that he's already the temperatures dropping just enough at night that he's already getting super cold, uncomfortable, and he's a little worried about, you know, his safety at this point. So many things we don't think about till we actually yeah. get into these situations. Jay, it is incredibly difficult to get around there with roads washed out, covered by debris. Talk about what you're seeing and just how hard it is to get around and some of the other challenges you're experiencing. Well, you have, well, the water is obviously an issue here. There's, it still hasn't completely, completely subsided. You have mud, rocks, and then in with all that, you have the debris from the towns and the, the destruction. Um, all this mixed together just makes it pretty complicated. Uh, we have some some pretty big trucks here that can get through some of the mud, some of the water. But when you mix that with rocks and debris, it makes it really difficult to get to these areas. So the hands-on from the guys, the teams here with us, uh, of going out and, and pulling this debris out, it is just it is a long process. It honestly is, just to try to get to a few miles down the road. <laughs> Any idea how long you're going to be there for, Jay? We're going to try to stay just as long as we can, um, as long as that need is there. And we have team members coming in, have the money to sustain us. We will, we will stay here and help as many people as possible. All right. Well, thank you for everything you're doing, Jay Carter. We appreciate mm -hmm. your time this morning. Please keep us updated, all right? Absolutely. Thank you guys for having us. Well, in the midst of all this destruction, a North Carolina man is being hailed as a hero after jumping into a fast-moving river to save a woman who had been swept away by the raging floodwaters from Hurricane Helene, along with her home. Reporter Aaron Thomas from our affiliate in Raleigh has the story of this dramatic rescue caught on camera. Over. As onlookers watched raging floodwaters sweep away a home, panic ensued for the woman still inside of it. When it was happening, I was trying to make a calculated risk. How do we save her? Eddie Hunnell lives in Holly Springs, but spent the past weekend in Grassy Creek, Ash County for his son's wedding. Are you back? Aftermath from Helene turned planned festivities into fright and fear, but that didn't stop Hunnell from jumping into action, literally. Oh my God. I grew up swimming on a swim team. I was a lifeguard. I'm in an okay shape, and I just couldn't watch her die. I felt like I needed to do that. A life vest and rope on hand, he got into the raging floodwaters from New River, retrieved Leslie Worth from the home, and brought her to safety. 
Leslie and her husband Phil posed with the hero after walking out of the river to everyone's relief and were bonus guests at the wedding rehearsal dinner, having lost all their personal belongings. Huddle didn't fully comprehend what happened until later that night. It didn't really hit me until I laid down in bed that night and about had a panic attack. <laughs> um, but I didn't see another option. An option demonstrating compassion for humanity. Mm. Well, today might be the first day of October, but summer-like temperatures are still heating up the West. All right, NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman's tracking the dangerous heat wave and more. Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning. Yeah, we have that fall heat wave still in full effect. We're going to see it lingering at least throughout most of this work week. We're waking up to 32 million Americans under heat alerts. That's in the West and to the Southwest. We have heat advisories for places like Chico, Fresno, down in Bakersfield. Also excessive heat warnings. That's where you're looking at that hot pink color. San Francisco, Las Vegas. Yuma, Phoenix, and we're going to see temperatures soaring well above average once again, 20, even 30 degrees in some spots and into the triple digits in many. Some of those spots into the 100, San Jose, Bakersfield, Las Vegas, uh, Phoenix, also Yuma. Notice the little box next to it. We're going to break some October daily records as well. We're looking at records possibly being broken in San Jose, in Bakersfield, Las Vegas, also in a Winslow, 95 degrees. And that warmth is going to spread on east as we head throughout the next couple of days. So Wednesday, we're looking at temperatures into the 90s in Denver, probably breaking a record there of 88 degrees. Winslow is going to be warm once again, warm once again in Phoenix, El Centro, Las Vegas, Fresno. And these temperatures are going to stay in place. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as well in many spots into the triple digits in Las Vegas, 102 on Friday, 102 on Saturday, still warm too in Los Angeles and also Phoenix. So that's one story. Now with that warmth in place, it's dry, also a little bit windy in portions of the Northern Plains, the Great Basin. So we do have fire danger, 4 million under uh, fire alerts. We have that red flag warning that's in the red and also a fire weather watch in the orange. So places like uh, Rabbit City, Casper, Alliance, Rock Springs, Rock Springs, and also Glasgow could see the threat for some fire today. That's one big weather story. Of course, we're still talking about the chance for some showers in portions of the central application at Appalachians into uh, portions of the mid-Atlantic. We're not talking about a whole lot of rain, but still enough on those saturated grounds. We're going to see what's left over of Helene finally moving out today. We do have the chance for some heavy rain, though, in portions of Virginia into the northern parts of North Carolina. Otherwise, the rest of the country looks really good today. High pressure in place. That's going to bring a really nice day for many of us. We have a cold front, though, in parts of the Great Lakes into the Ohio Valley. That's going to make its way towards the east as we head throughout the next couple of days. And then notice in Florida, we're looking at the chance for some showers and storms. Not big storms, but could see some frequent lightning with any of those storms. Radar showing us where those showers are falling. Still seeing that rain falling. And we are seeing pockets of heavier rain where you see those brighter colors. The reds, the oranges, the yellows, and portions of Virginia. Virginia into West Virginia. So something to watch out as we head throughout the day. This is the good news. We're going to finally see it move offshore today, and that's going to give us a little bit of a break. Unfortunately, that cold front is going to bring the threat for more showers as we head throughout the rest of today and to the Ohio Valley and also tomorrow. Additional rainfall, we're going to see about a quarter inch in some spots. Some spots could see up to an inch, but things are looking better weather-wise, helping with those recovery efforts. A little bit helps. Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Michelle. Sure. Well, this morning, tens of thousands of dock workers at the biggest ports along the East Coast are on strike, demanding a new contract with higher pay in a work stoppage that could actually hit the economy hard. Union port workers from the International Longshoremen's Association walked off the job right at midnight Eastern time, just after their contract expired. There was a last-minute offer from the U.S. Maritime Alliance, which represents the major ocean freight operators, but it was not enough to reach a deal with the union after months of stalled negotiations. Now, 14 ports across the eastern and Gulf Coast have come to a total stop. Those ports handle about half the shipping imports into the U.S., leaving billions of dollars' worth of trade stranded. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans joins us now from the Port of Bayonne, New Jersey with the latest. Christine, good morning. So this is the first time the Longshoremen's Association has walked off the job in nearly 50 years. The two sides had not been yeah. talking in months, but there was, as I mentioned, that last minute offer that was rejected. Can you walk us through that offer and just what the workers are asking for? 
So the workers really want uh, limits on automation and they want better pay. They want at least the better pay that the West Coast got when it, it had its strike a couple of, uh, of years ago. Now, they were offered last night by the Shippers Association, the Shippers Consortium, essentially 50, uh, a 50 percent pay raise and then, uh, you know, a big uh, addition to their retirement contributions and they rejected it. So um, they're at least talking. They hadn't been talking in a very, very long time. Another big piece of this, the pay is a big piece of it, but then the automation for gates and trucks and, and just port operations. You know, automation is something that uh, shippers have been pursuing around the world, and the Longshoremen's Association very worried that that could be existential, a real existential threat for longshoremen. Christine, the big question here is how much could this strike potentially hurt the economy? And then what does it mean for all of us consumers across the country? I, I understand sure. one stat here. Some analysts say that the strike could cost the U.S. economy up to four and a half billion dollars each day of the strike. Can you explain yeah. how that is and which industries are going to be the most impacted? I mean, just there's just so much stuff sitting on these ships coming into these ports and sitting in these containers on these ports that normally is just zipping through the country every single day, every single minute of every single day. And so when that all stops, you've got cars, car parts, cherries, frozen chicken, uh, computers, uh, apparel. I mean, everything you can think of. I mean, the United States imports an awful lot of stuff and about half of it comes through these ports here on the east and gulf coast so it's just about everything you can think of now the big retailers they've seen this coming they've seen this dispute in the making for months and they've really been trying to draw forward a lot of the goods that they're going to need into the end of the year but for some small manufacturers for small business owners for for people who have assembly lines that re rely on just in time inventory that's a you know a business phrase where you know you don't have a lot of stuff on hand they may they have to, you know, close down some of their assembly lines while they wait for goods to get here when, you know, and for this to be finally resolved. So, Christine, what's the Maritime Alliance saying about all this? And now that the strike has started, <laughs> any plans for the two sides to meet? I mean, as far as we know, they're not talking right now. They were speaking last night. At least they had uh, had offered that 50 percent pay, pay raise and it had been rejected. And now it's been radio silence since then, guys. All right. Christine Romans, thank you so much. There's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, the new research that suggests doing something you love, like listening to music, could be better than coffee at helping you concentrate. First, though, after the break, a vice presidential showdown set for tonight. What to expect from the first and likely only VP debate. Stay with us. We're back now with the latest on the race for the White House. Election day five weeks from today, and tonight the running mates are in the spotlight. They're now preparing for the vice presidential debate. Minnesota Democratic Governor Tim Walz and Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance will face off in New York. This is likely the final chance for each campaign to make their case on the debate stage. While it will be their first time sharing that stage, they have not shied away from sharing their feelings about each other in public. Tim Waltz's record is a joke. He's been one of the most far-left radicals in the entire United States government at any level. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, <laughs> had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! More, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns and NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. Good morning to both of you. So, Dasha, unlike the presidential debate, this showdown is going to feature hot mics. They won't be muted when the other person's speaking. What else could be different about tonight? And just what are both candidates saying ahead of this debate? Yeah, Joe, good morning. That's right. Look, it's going to be 90 minutes with uh, two four-minute breaks, no audience, and we are already playing the expectation-setting game here. Both campaigns trying to lower expectations for their candidate and raise the bar for the opponent. Waltz and his team emphasizing the Ivy League pedigree that Senator J.D. Vance has and the Vance team emphasizing the many years of political experience that uh, t Governor Tim Walz has. So, both are looking to uh, set those expectations early and hope that their candidate beats those expectations, guys. John, let's bring you in here. So both Walls and Vance, they are Midwesterners, but I mean, obviously they're quite different. What message do you expect each candidate is going to get across to undecided voters tonight? And what will it be that's so starkly different between them? 
I mean, we've been watching this uh, play out over the last several weeks, uh, Savannah. There's going to be scratching. There's going to be clawing. We're looking at a real cat fight uh, between <laughs> these two. Uh, and But it's not really going to be J.D. Vance versus Tim Wallace. It's going to be how well does J.D. Vance tear down Kamala Harris versus how well does Tim Wallace tear mm-hmm. down Donald Trump. It is the very rare voter who is going to make their decision on uh, whether to vote for Donald Trump uh, for president or whether to vote for Kamala Harris for president yeah. based on either of these two guys. Mm. You say cat fight, I guarantee the word cat will come up at some point tonight. <laughs> so, Dasha, Walls and Vance, Drink. they have not been on the national scene as long as VP Harris and Mr. Trump. So how have they been preparing for the debate tonight? Well, you mentioned that these two Midwesterners are very different, different vibes from each candidate and different vibes in debate prep, it seems like, from the reporting that our team has. So the Waltz team has been calling debate camp, quote, Camp North Star, because the, the goal is that it's about Governor Waltz being Governor Waltz, staying true to himself and not necessarily being as polished as they say uh, Senator J.D. Vance might be. Uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has been playing the role of Vance in debate prep. It's been less formal. Uh, uh, they only recently did a full mock debate, whereas Team Vance, the approach has been in-person and virtual practice sessions over Zoom. They've been uh, doing what they call murder boards, where they uh, practice for some of those really tough questions. Representative Tom Emmer has been playing Tim Walls and has been doing a pretty good job, very prepared for it, uh, according to our reporting. And uh, they have been watching a lot of tape of Walls, running back the tape and preparing for for what might come their way, guys. John, you mentioned maybe this isn't how voters are going to decide is based on who they like better on a stage tonight, but, right, hopefully they're deciding on issues. How much do you think we will hear about the issues? Do you think we could get any more details like we were hoping in the last debate for economic plans, anything like that? Yeah, interestingly, both of these candidates are uh, people who are very familiar with uh, public policy and a broad range of public policy, so Tim Walz. Uh, you know, spent time in Congress, has been governor of Minnesota, J.D. Vance, of course, the Ohio senator. Um, It may be that we get more substance in this debate, uh, but I do think that for the most part, what you're going to want to be listening for is uh, who's who's more effective at tearing down the other side's candidate. So, John, I mean, Uh, the the presidential candidate. Yeah, I mean, the reality check is the VP debates tend to not move the needle so much. Does this one feel different at all? Um, you never know. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to predict and say uh, that you know that there's no chance that this moves the needle one one direction or the other. But uh, I mean, it would be the extraordinarily rare vice presidential debate that was remembered for anything uh, other than some sort of oddity. I mean, we remember Mike Pence with the fly in his hair uh, <laughs> in the last election in 2020. Uh, Admiral James Stockdale, who was uh, Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate, asking why he was there and who he was. Uh, but, you know, it's, again, very rare for a vice presidential debate to be memorable. Admiral Stockdale reference. That is awesome, John. All right, Dasha I'm Burns. Old, <laughs> Dasha Burns, Jonathan Allen, thank you both. Thank Appreciate you. it. You can check out tonight's VP debate on NBC and right here at NBC News Now. Our special coverage begins at 8 o'clock Eastern. Bye. Coming up, devastating in more ways than one. Up next in our weekly check-in, how disasters like Hurricane Helene could have lasting effects on mental health and what survivors can do to cope. Up first, though, after the break, a sad morning for the sports world and beyond as we mourn the deaths of two legends. Morning News Now will be right back. Time now for our weekly mental health check-in. This week, we are taking a look at the mental health impact of natural disasters like Helene. Yeah, plus a new study out of New York University has tips on improving concentration, including music and even perfume. For a breakdown of all that and a little more, let's bring in Dr. George James. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist and friend of the show. Dr. James, good to have you with us this morning. Uh, Let's talk about... What we've been talking about for the last few days here, the devastation left mm-hmm. behind from Helene. The Red Cross has sent disaster mental health workers to some of the worst hit areas. What sort of work are they going to be doing on the ground? And just what do people caught up in natural disasters like this need to do for their mental health while they're also dealing with recovery? Maybe they don't have a home trying to find just basic necessities. 
Yeah, good morning, Joe. Uh, met, uh, mental health for folks who are going through disasters, natural disasters like Helena, is really important. You're overwhelmed, you're sad, you're tr you're experiencing some trauma, and you might already live in an area that has experienced these disasters before. So you have maybe some level of anxiety. Some people even have some PTSD. So it's important that you talk to someone, that you get the help, that you admit that you need support. You talk to friends and family, you take care of those that you love, but also make sure that you have ongoing help because it doesn't just stop up after things get cleared up, it goes on for a period of time. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, continuing with the topic of people who have been through large-scale traumatic events, I do want to turn to a new study. It shows ultimately the power of self-compassion. This is from scientists at the University of California. They found that Syrian refugees who practice that, who practice self-compassion, experienced significantly less depression and anxiety. Now, refugees from more, of course, have, they've had their lives uprooted, but how was this practiced and how did it help? Is there a message here for everyone? There's definitely a message here for everyone. This is something that I, I share with the people that I work with. Self-compassion is what we say to ourselves. It's being able to be kind and thoughtful to ourselves. And in this particular study, it was refugees being able to say that they're going through a tough time, but but it's a human experience or that I, I can get through this or I'm a good person. Being able to have self-compassion helps you to endure the pain and the difficulty, and it reduces the mental health strain that you might have in those moments. So please practice kindness to yourself. Sometimes one of the hardest things for us to do, and so it's mm. a good reminder that it's so important. All right, let's look at this NYU study about how simple pleasures like listening to music or smelling perfume can help improve your concentration, and that can maybe even have a greater impact than caffeine. So tell us how this works. In this study, what they tried to do is to connect uh, wearable uh, devices with uh, smells or sensations to be able to see what concentration uh, could do. And the, the benefit of this is being able to say, sometimes some smells, some uh, things that we participate in can actually make us feel better or put us in a better mood, which then might help us, help us to be more productive or even have more focus as certain pleasant smells or uh, certain things that we like to do. So think of, for this is to think about what works for you and maybe pair that when it's time to do some work and that might help you to focus and to concentrate. And that might be different what music you listen to versus what I might or what you might like to smell, but try those things and it could possibly work for you. All right, Dr. George James, thank you so much. Good to have you with us. There is much more morning news now right ahead. Welcome back. Let's get to some money news. Auto giant Stellantis is back in the headlines over a new recall impacting some Jeep models. CNBC's Savannah Hanau has that and some other dollar sign headlines. Good morning, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Good morning to Yes, Stellantis is recalling more than 150,000 plug-in hybrid Jeeps, and it's due to a potential fire risk. The, uh, the parent of Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, and Fiat says a routine review of customer data led to an investigation that discovered a dozen fires in vehicles that were parked and turned off. Now, the recall affects the 2020 to 2024 Jeep Wrangler and 2022 to 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Stellantis says the risk seems to be lowered when the battery charge is depleted. It's advising owners not to charge their vehicles and park them away from buildings or other cars until the issue is resolved. Ford is throwing in a free home charger and installation with the purchase or lease of an electric vehicle. And the offer applies to the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the F-150 Lightning or E-Transit bought between October 1st and January 2nd. Owners will get a level two charger at home, which normally costs $1,300 and another $2,000 for installation. And Saturday Night Live kicking off the 50th season on a high note. The premiere episode drawing in 5.3 million viewers. It's the most since 2020. NBC Universal also saying the episode was the most watched ever on Peacock through its first weekend. SNL was hosted by Gene Smart. Some upcoming hosts this season include Ariana Grande, John Mulaney, and Michael Keaton, guys. Something tells me we might see Jim Gaffigan back as Governor Walls Ooh, this weekend. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Probably. We've got like a month, right, for them to squeeze exactly. all the yeah, exactly. out of the election exactly. cycle. Exactly. There's plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> Silvana, thank you.
All right, now to a story about how the happiest place on earth landed one couple in a legal nightmare. Two Disney fanatics were kicked out of Disneyland's exclusive and expensive members only Club 33. The pair went to court to try and get their memberships reinstated, but lost, costing them, they say, $400,000 in legal fees. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has more on how they're still fighting to try and get back in the club. A pricey and secretive members-only club at Disneyland now in the spotlight. This after an Arizona couple's membership was revoked, costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. The park claiming Scott Anderson was drunk at Disney's Club 33, the elite paid membership club. But Anderson says he was suffering from a medical issue. I wasn't found to be drunk in the park. I had a vestibular migraine in the park, which was which was horrific. Their lawsuit to have their memberships reinstated failing when a jury sided with Disney earlier this month. We reached out to Disney about the lawsuit, but have not heard back. I had two beers and a half a glass of wine. So what exactly is Club 33? The website vaguely describes it as a private membership club with a variety of tailored experiences at both Disneyland and Disney World. But Disney super fans share an inside look at some of the experiences on social media. I ordered the Le Ramon Fizz for my first drink, which was delicious. And then the pear salad, scallop, and filet mignon as my first three courses. And we may or may not have shopped for some merch. There might be a haul coming soon. You get 50 single day guest passes to the parks, private VIP tour once a year, LA parking, which honestly might be the best part of this entire thing. The Andersons say it was a dream come true to finally be accepted to Disneyland's Club 33 at the California theme park after more than a decade on the wait list, no matter the pricey membership fees. $10,000 back when we first joined. Today that membership is $32,000. It's like four times as much money as, as you know, we thought it was going to be. And it was like, okay, great. But, you know, I mean, this is this is our world at this point. Once they were in, their attorney says they were regular visitors going at least 80 times a year there to get the VIP treatment and behind the scenes access. We had just tons of amazing experiences. We had dinner inside the Haunted Mansion. And to them, when they would go to Disneyland, they would have these fantastic moments that you can't recreate, you couldn't, you couldn't even set up, and they became lifelong memories. And for them, that was worth every dollar, every cent that they spent. The couple says they spent as much as $125,000 a year in visits. As any avid Disney person would be, that would be your dream, would be to member, be a member of Club 33. But access to those special perks means abiding by terms and conditions set by the park. Private membership organizations have enormous discretion over who to admit and who to kick out based on whatever rules they decide. As for the Andersons, they say they aren't giving up their legal battle just yet and plan to appeal. My wife's loved Disney her whole life. We are going to continue the fight. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. The Andersons told The Hollywood Reporter that despite being kicked out of Club 33, they're not banned from Disney properties and will continue to visit the theme parks. Well, some of the fastest women in the world are convening right now here in New York City for a track meet like no other. NBC News Now anchors in Clay Esamoa takes us to the inaugural event that organizers say is all part of a push for equal pay. Set. It's being called the Coachella of sport. Paulino will back up her win in Paris. Headlined by rapper Megan Thee Stallion at New York's Icon Stadium, a crowd of 5,000 fans, celebrities, and athletes gathered for Athlos, a track meet like no other. This is women's sport. This is the future of what's happening in our world. The lineup included 36 women athletes, the winners of each event adorned with a quintessentially New York prize, a Tiffany crown. Oh, I feel so excited. This is like a one in a lifetime moment and I'm just grateful to be a part of the experience. This is just giving us women in track and field the visibility that we need and so I'm really, really happy that this is happening. We can hear the booming crowd. You got Meg Thee Stallion, D Nice and the fastest women in the world. Yeah, it's out of the lineup. Why put this on? Why not? I mean, just hearing you describe it, I'm like, I hope I still have a seat for this thing. Athlos founder and entrepreneur Alexis Ohanian is no stranger to the world of women's sports, married to tennis megastar Serena Williams. When I pitched her on Athlos, it was an insta yes. And she was like, this is a great idea. I see it. 
You've got to do it. There is a high... Ohanian, an investor in women's sports in his own right. The founding investor in L.A.'s Angel City Football Club now ranked the most valuable women's sports team in the world. You recently said you wouldn't want your daughter Olympia to enter into the world of women's sports if she didn't earn what she was worth. Yeah, well, credit credit to Serena. I was like, hey, you know, Serena, wouldn't it be nice one day if Olympia played on the national team? And without Mr. B, Serena's like, not until they pay her what she's worth. And I said, challenge accepted. According to a 2023 report, on average, female athletes earn 21 times less than their male counterparts. In track and field, that source of income is reliant on championship wins. Athlos hoping to change that every participant earning a cash prize. With the star-studded event capitalizing on the growing momentum of women's sports. And the reigning Olympic champion. In the With some of the biggest names from this year's Olympics hitting the Athlos track. Battle on the inside. Three-time Olympic gold medalist Gabby Thomas running the 200-meter dash, placing second behind Paris 2024 bronze medalist Brittany Brown. I couldn't say no to being a part of something like this. Everyone here is getting paid tonight. Why does that matter? That matters a lot because, I mean, it's equity in women's sports, right? We work really hard. We're a really good product. And track and field is in such a good place right now where we can actually move the sport forward and drive competition. The top cash prize for something like this would be $30,000. That's right. You doubled that. And as I understand it, every woman who leaves tonight Mm -hmm. running is mm -hmm. going to get a cash prize. Oh, yes. And a share of the revenue. So 10% of all the revenue tonight, 10% goes into a pool, and every woman who lines up gets a share of it as well. All with the hopes of getting equal pay to the finish line. It's honestly a blessing for all of us that we're able to be in an era where the sport is changing and diversifying. I hope this is something that happens every year, and they invite different women every year to be competitive. Hmm. Our thanks to Zinke SMR for the report. How fun. Coming up, a centennial celebration fit for a president. Former President Jimmy Carter turns 100 years old today. The special tribute being planned next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. The fabulous Broadway standout Anne Juliet is adding yet another star to its Tony-nominated ensemble. TikTok icon and professional dancer Ch Charlie D'Amelio will be starring in the Jukebox musical, which is a reimagining of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Producers describe her part as a dance-heavy role. That's a good fit for Charlie, who, before becoming one of the most followed TikTokers in the world, danced competitively for more than a decade. She even won Dancing with the Stars back in 2022. Yeah. You can catch Charlie's debut on The Great White Way later this month at the one and only Stephen Sondheim Theater. But make haste. The performances, as of now, are slated to only run until January of next year. They have a lot of uh, turnover for the cast with Anne Juliet. A lot of the original Broadway cast is leaving right now and making way for some new people to come there in. The go. show remains like a hit. Charlie, we love it. Wow, yeah. well, that's going to be a hit with a lot of Gen Zers. No too. kidding, exactly. Yeah. Charlie, my gosh. Awesome, thanks, Joe. Well, finally this hour, we are celebrating former President Jimmy Carter on his 100th birthday. Here's NBC News correspondent Andrea Mitchell with a look at how America is honoring a record-breaking birthday and one remarkable legacy. A birthday bash for the ages. Family, friends, and fans celebrating Jimmy Carter, the only U.S. president to reach 100. What keeps him going? You know, I don't know what keeps him going. I think, I think he doesn't know how to give up on anything. Dubbed the rock and roll president in the 70s. In some ways, my grandfather got elected with music, right? The Allman Brothers, Jimmy Buffett, all these folks raised money for him. I mean, it made him cool. A Washington outsider, the Georgia governor and peanut farmer, was at first called Jimmy Who when he said he was running for the White House. The one-term president brokered peace between Israel and Egypt at Camp David. He's Mr. Resilience, and for him to live to 100, that is amazing and imagine all the things that those eyes have seen good morning to you how you doing Mr. carter is best known for his legacy after the white house i remember my mom talking about jimmy carter how he built houses with his own hands with his wife rosalind carter built thousands of houses for habitat for humanity and was awarded the nobel peace prize in 2002. there's not enough word in the dictionary to say thank you to mr carter As President Carter liked to say when he taught Sunday school, use your talent to help others, a message he has preached and practiced for a century.
Our thanks to Andrea Mitchell for that report. He is 100 years young with no plans on slowing down. Mr. Carter's family reportedly says the next item on his bucket list is voting on Election Day, go. which is five, five weeks, weeks from today. <laughs> All right, that is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, turmoil at America's ports. Overnight, thousands of dock workers from Massachusetts to Texas walking off the job. It's a high-stakes labor dispute that could cost the economy billions of dollars a day. How the strike could impact the upcoming holiday season. In the Middle East this morning, a major escalation in Lebanon. Israel launching a widely expected ground offensive country insisting the operation is limited in scope, taking aim at Hezbollah targets near its northern border. Our Richard Engel is in Beirut with the latest. Plus, the race for relief in the wake of Helene. Both Vice President Harris and former President Trump focusing attention on the utter devastation left in Helene's wake. That comes as questions are mounting over the government's response to the superstorm that has left more than 100 dead and hundreds of thousands still without power. Sobering backdrop to tonight's vice presidential debate in primetime. We are covering it all. And the new claims surrounding the death of Queen Elizabeth, what Britain's former prime minister, Boris Johnson, says he knew about a closely guarded health condition, and how people are reacting in the UK and beyond. Quite a talker there. We'll Absolutely. delve into that one. Let's begin this hour with that historic strike hitting some of the nation's biggest trade ports this morning. Thousands of workers have walked off the job, sparking concerns about what this could mean for the U.S. economy as we head into the holiday season. Yeah, it's union workers at 14 major ports across the eastern and Gulf Coast are now on the picket lines after their labor contracts ended at midnight. The stalled negotiations put the shipping industry at a standstill with billions of dollars worth of trade stranded until a new deal is reached. Here's NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans with the latest from one of those ports in New Jersey. After months at an impasse, the strike deadline has come and gone, and now the first East Coast port strike in 47 years is underway. This morning, docks from Boston to Miami to Houston shut down. This is going down in history, what we're doing here. After tens of thousands of workers went on strike at midnight, affecting the docks that take in half of U.S. imports. We plan on being here 24-7 until we uh, finalize or uh, get a good contract from uh, the shippers. Those ports handle products Americans use throughout their daily lives, from groceries to electronics, cars and hospital supplies. We're deeply concerned about the impact that a strike could have on our supply chains, especially when it comes to critical goods like medical supplies and others. This comes after a six-year contract between ports, shippers, and the international longshoremen expired. The group representing ports and shippers saying the workers' union has repeatedly refused to come to the table to bargain on a new contract. It all comes down to automation and increased wages. The union seeking to restrict how much of these ports can be run by automated cranes, gates and trucks. Workers hoping for pay increases larger than the 32 percent hike West Coast workers got. Nothing's going to move without us. No. We're going to keep this thing going every day in and out. A shutdown could cost the U.S. economy up to four and a half billion dollars per day. Retailers like Walmart and Home Depot could be caught in the middle. Electronics giant Samsung, also a major importer. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce calling on President Biden to block the strike. But the White House telling NBC News he isn't currently planning to use that power. The Shippers Consortium did offer a 50 percent pay raise to the dock workers, but that was rejected. And now, hours into this first strike in 47 years, unclear how long this will last. Back to you. All right, Christine, thank you very much. Days after Hurricane Helene delivered a powerful punch to the southeast, the storm's devastation continues to mount. At least 125 people are dead. Dozens of others are still unaccounted for as search and rescue efforts continue. Today, anchor Craig Melvin has the latest. And a good day to you from uh, what's left of the Arts District here in Asheville, just beyond downtown Asheville. To my right, this is the French Broad River. Uh, that river, uh, a bit too much for what's left of an outdoor sporting goods store uh, behind me. 
that building just one of many all over Asheville, all over the southeast right now. One of the many buildings and homes completely decimated, not so much by the initial storm, but the aftermath, the flooding uh, that has just run rampant. As you know, the death toll right now all over the southeast, more than 120. That's expected to climb. There's still a number of people who are unaccounted for. Uh, folks here in this area calling it an unprecedented storm. They are right now demanding an unprecedented response. In Hurricane Helene's wake, devastation and destruction stretching as far as the eye can see. We were not prepared for this. The powerful Category 4 storm causing damage in at least 10 states. Hardest hit, North Carolina, where every single county has been impacted. And we're dealing with a situation that is unlike anybody's ever seen. The town of Asheville isolated, cut off from power, water, and cell service. Homes and businesses destroyed, testing the resilience of its residents. My business and my job and my livelihood and all that, so, you know, <laughs> I don't know. This video showing the flood's sheer power as it rushed in. Everything's gone. Leaving down trees and power lines, buckled railroad tracks, cars overturned. Devastation I saw firsthand driving through the streets. In Henderson County, families in need were given a meal and water bottles to help tide them over for the day. And how would you describe the scene so far today? It has been a very busy, chaotic scene, trying to get water to residents who have not had water since Thursday. Some more help now on the way. The National Guard moving in. FEMA also sending support. President Biden says he'll travel to the region tomorrow for an aerial tour, explaining he doesn't want his trip to divert resources. I've directed my team to provide every, every available resource as fast as possible to your communities. The destruction stretching more than 600 miles across state lines. The impact of uh, Hurricane Helene is historic. In Tennessee, more than 100 people are still missing. Family members desperately waiting for news about their loved ones. The state's infrastructure also taking a catastrophic hit. Hundreds of bridges destroyed or damaged. In Georgia, hundreds of thousands left without electricity. Amid the pain, though, hope and heroes stepping in. Dramatic rescues through the storm. In Western North Carolina, a man jumping into raging waters to save a woman whose home was being swept away in the flood. I just couldn't watch her die. I felt like I needed to do that. Up and down the coast, communities coming together. Somebody's going to help them from our community because that's how we are. Nobody will be left alone out here. That southern hospitality showing up in a time of great need. We just want to help. That's all we're doing. And we have seen so much of that firsthand. Uh, neighbor helping neighbor, stranger helping stranger, not just here in Asheville, but all over the affected areas here in the southeast. A lot of folks who are watching right now, uh, who are listening right now, might be wondering what they can do to help. How can I be a part of, of the solution here? Uh, there's, of course, always the Red Cross. Um, and officials here on the ground, FEMA officials, are advising folks to check with local areas to see precisely what they need, whether it's money, whether it's manpower, uh, whether it's blood. Uh, a lot of blood drives going on as well right now. That's the very latest from here in Asheville. For now, we'll send it back to you. All right, Craig, thank you. Well, we've been reporting on this show that the fast-moving floodwater stranded more than 50 people on the roof of a hospital in eastern Tennessee. Angel Mitchell joining us now is one of the people who was rescued. Angel, good morning. We really appreciate your time during such a difficult time. Thank you for joining us. We understand, but, but please walk us through your story that you were visiting your 83-year-old mother who was being treated for pneumonia when you both had to evacuate. If you could just start from the beginning and telling us how this all unfolded, how quickly this happened happened th that you were made aware of this especially since you were there for a visit and then what unfolded we we were told maybe two minutes before the flood come through that we needed to evacuate and um which i'm pretty sure we should have had more time than that they knew, already knew but they didn't let us know and then once we went to evacuate the it was already flooded cars and 
was getting swept away. The ambulances that were going to transport people were being swept away. They put us in lifeboats. That was not safe enough. They couldn't get, get us across that way. So we had to get to the rooftop and wait for some choppers to come. Um, that took a long time. The winds were too bad to get regular choppers in, so they had to bring in Blackhawks. And, yeah, that's my mom. My mom is down there in that raft over there. Um, they had to lower the boom, I think it's called, and hoist her up from the, from the ground up to the air. And then they brought another one. We all just got shoved in as many as they could, <laughs> as many as they could fit in there. We got shoved in there, and they tried to get us out of there as fast as they could. Um, took us to the high school, but it on the roof, it was insane. There was houses floating by, um, barns, cars, you name it. I saw an airplane, I guess a personal airplane. It had floated down. It, Angel, it was just really scary. What was going through your mind during all of this? Well, I was scared to death. My mama was still in, we were on the roof and my mama was still down there in the water and the lifeboat. But the rescue people were down there with her, luckily. But she was soaking wet, all that muddy water on her. I was just scared to death that my mama was going to drown. Mm. Um, and then I was scared we were all going to drown because the the waters was coming so high, we only had about probably 10 more feet before it would have came across the hospital roof. It was it was pretty insane. Yeah, the pictures are, are just unbelievable, and it's really just amazing that you lived through this experience. How are you doing now? How is your mother doing now? Of course, a reminder, you were visiting her in the hospital for pneumonia. She goes through this whole thing yeah. being put in this rescue boat. How's she doing? Um, well, she's doing okay. We're at the Med John City Medical Center. That's where they transported us to. Um, but unfortunately, and I hope some people will pray for her, um, she, we just found out she has colon cancer mm. yesterday. So oh. that's, that's really upsetting for me, but she's went through a lot the last few days. Oh, Angel Mitchell, we are so sorry to hear that. We certainly will keep her in our, our prayers and Again, we so appreciate you. your time during such a difficult time, and we are so happy you're Of course, both. yes. Okay. Now, I just think that people should know that we should have had more time mm. to know to evacuate. And I'm pretty sure that Ballot Health president knew um, hours ahead of time, and he kept telling them to just wait, wait, and we'll see how bad it gets. Well, we wait. He waited too long before the evacuation started. What well, what makes you think that he knew? Uh, because well, I heard the nurses, doctors talking about it, saying, um, like hours before that, they were saying we need to evacuate. He's telling us to wait. We need to evacuate. Mm -hmm. And but they couldn't. They had to wait to get the word before we could get out of there mm. and it was just almost too late angel obviously such an intense experience and we really appreciate it that you shared it with us we're thinking about you and your mom thank you thank you and also that that place was already deemed a flood zone the hospital area years ago mm. like 100 years ago they had deemed it a flood zone and I don't know why Ballot Health decided to build there, but they did, and mm. it was a mistake. They should not have yeah. built there. Angel, thank you very much. We're thinking about you. Thank the devastation brought by Hurricane Helene is shining a light on the issue of flood insurance. In the coming days and weeks, households will look to rebuild, and the costs could be enormous. But data from the Insurance Information Institute shows that only 6% of U.S. homeowners have flood insurance coverage. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss takes us inside the growing problem.
Right now across the South, people are still struggling to meet basic daily needs, but soon communities ravaged by flooding from Hurricane Helene will have to start rebuilding. The financial toll on homeowners will depend largely on how they were insured before the storm. And with storms getting stronger, experts say many people nationwide do not have the coverage they need. <laughs> this is terrible. Hurricane Helene's winds leveled parts of Florida. Then the rain swallowed whole towns in North Carolina. I think there's somebody in that truck. We can't get our nine more on the work. Including Asheville, which was considered vulnerable to flooding, but not like this. I have never been more scared in my life. Those with flood insurance will have some protection. Everyone else will have to rely on FEMA for financial help. It has become an all too familiar story. Because of climate change, storms are more intense. Warmer air holds more moisture. In the last two years, torrential downpours have caused historic flooding from Vermont to New York City, Chicago, and Connecticut. How much water? Over four feet. And it came Nelba Marquez-Green was away on vacation with her husband and son in August when the water started rising. I contacted my friend and said, hey, can you go by the house? Had you ever had flooding here before? No, but people were responding in a way that was very alarming. You can tell the devastation was severe and quick. For Marquez Green, it was hardship on top of tragedy. Her six-year-old daughter, Anna, was murdered in the Sandy Hook school shooting. The piano Anna played on now destroyed by the flood. To not have that now feels like rubbing salt in the wound. It's, a, yet, it's yet another injustice on top of what we've already been through. On top of that, she was shocked to learn her insurance wouldn't cover the damage. What was their message to you when you asked for help? You don't have coverage for flood. And that's it. That's it. Now she says the family is facing roughly $100,000 in repairs. Did anyone even say to you, you know, you might want to think about flood insurance? I only remember one conversation regarding water, and that was from the home inspector and him saying, this is the driest basement I've ever seen. You don't even need a dehumidifier down here. This basement has never gotten water before. Many insurance companies strip flood damage from homeowners' policies after a massive and expensive Mississippi River flood in the 1920s. Today, FEMA, together with private partners, manages the National Flood Insurance Program. If it can rain at your home, it can flood. More than 5 million Americans are covered, but analysts say millions more need coverage and don't have it. The insurance agent needs to be a principal communicator about the risk and the opportunity for that flood cover. And the consumer must do their homework and make sure that they have the financial protections they need. Nelba and her family are waiting to see if FEMA will be able to help them. We need to keep homeowners safe in a different way. And people need to be thinking about floods. And people need to be thinking about floods. It's unconscionable that we are where we are right now. For families who don't have flood insurance, their response depends in part on how FEMA characterizes damage in their communities. An event as catastrophic as what's happened in North Carolina will likely qualify for federal funds, but residents will have to apply for relief. And it's not an easy process or a quick one. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Let's now get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us with the forecast. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. And overall, we are relatively quiet on this Tuesday. Tomorrow's going to be relatively quiet, too. We are watching a few things, though. First, you notice on the map some green showing up in the mid-Atlantic, parts of the Appalachians as well. That's what's left over from Helene finally moving off the coast. So the heaviest rain will be from portions of Virginia into North Carolina. Otherwise, it's relatively just scattered showers. We have this long, stretching cold front that's going to bring the chance for some showers to the Great Lakes, also the Ohio Valley. Notice lots of sunshine through the northern plains, the central plains, the southern plain. Another big weather story, though, will be the record warm continuing in the southwest. We're going to see temperatures well above normal for this time of year, 10, even 20 degrees above normal into the triple digits. Lots of sunshine in the northwest as well. And then we have a fire risk in the northern plains. That's because we're dry, windy, and warm. So we're going to watch that once again tomorrow. This is Wednesday. That fire risk does continue. The record's high continue, record highs continue 
continue as well on Wednesday into Thursday into Friday. This is a long stretching heat wave and it's early in the season. It's October. We're going to break some October daily records. Lots of sunshine, nice and quiet throughout the Great Lakes and Northern Plains, the Central Plains into the Tennessee Valley. The good news into the Mid-Atlantic looking much, much better. Lots of sunshine throughout uh, parts of the Great Lakes. We do have the chance for some um, showers in the eastern Great Lakes. Florida, we could see some showers once again tomorrow. We have the chance for some showers and storms in Florida as well today. So let's talk about that rain that we're expecting in the Mid-Atlantic. We've been talking about this for days and days and days and still seeing the chance for those showers. Even seeing some heavier rain, that's where you're seeing those darker colors, the reds, the yellows, the oranges. But notice most of the heavy rain is now moving over the Atlantic and that will be the trend as we go throughout today into tomorrow. This, if you can believe it, is still with leftover from Helene, finally making its way off the coast. And we will see some heavy rain from parts of Virginia into North Carolina. Guys, we'll end it here because we're looking at that dangerous heat wave continuing out west. 32 million under heat alerts. And we're going to see temperatures well into the triple digits, even 110 in some spots. Oh, reminder, it's October now. Yes. I know. Let's go with oh, it, right, Southwest? Up. Breaking <laughs> those records. Ooh. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Turning now to the latest in the Middle East, Israel began a ground invasion against Hezbollah into southern Lebanon overnight in what the IDF is calling limited, localized, and targeted raids. It is the latest escalation in the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Iran backed group Hezbollah. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has the latest from Beirut. Good morning. Israeli troops, for now, appear to be operating very close to the Israel Lebanon border. But this war could be about to expand. Just this morning, the Israeli military ordered the evacuation of dozens of Lebanese villages, saying that Hezbollah is using them as bases and telling residents to leave to save their lives. Israel's ground incursion into Lebanon is underway. A cross border drive to attack Hezbollah on its own terrain. U.S. officials tell NBC News Israel informed the Biden administration ahead of time, describing the operation as short, days, not weeks, and limited in its geographic reach. I want to make it clear. A war is with Hezbollah, not with the people of Lebanon. U.S. officials tell NBC News the administration is concerned Israel's operation could expand. And this morning, the Israeli military issued an ominous warning, telling Lebanese not to travel in vehicles south of the Latani River, suggesting a large part of southern Lebanon could become an open war zone. Israel says its goal is to create a buffer zone free of Hezbollah from the Latani River to the Israeli border to prevent the Iranian-backed militia from using the area to launch attacks against Israel. We've just crossed into southern Lebanon, the area that Israel hopes to make its buffer zone. Almost no one is heading south. All the traffic we're seeing are vehicles, motorcycles heading north. And this morning, Hezbollah fired more rockets at Israel. Hezbollah claims to have 100,000 fighters. Independent analysts say the actual number may be closer to half of that. Still, a major dedicated force dug in on its own terrain with years of preparation. But Israel has weakened Hezbollah significantly, killing the group's leader, decimating its chain of command, and booby-trapping its communication. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said he sees this war as part of a larger battle against all of Iran's proxies in the Middle East. Yesterday, he addressed the Iranian people directly. There is nowhere in the Middle East Israel cannot reach. There is nowhere we will not go to protect our people and protect our country. Hezbollah's deputy leader vowed the group will emerge victorious. The Pentagon has announced that it is sending several thousand reinforcements to the Middle East and squadrons of fighter jets. President Biden continues to call for a ceasefire. Richard, thank you. For more, let's bring in NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, good to have you with us. What are Israel's goals right now in Lebanon? Is it possible for them in this mission to destroy Hezbollah? Well, it's impossible over the longer term to destroy any of the proxies uh, Iran has in the region. That would take an enormous amount of time, uh, lots and lots of people, and it would require occupation of areas uh, where the proxies are now, including in Yemen, where the Houthis are. So uh, it's clear that their immediate objective is to clear that area just north of the border with Lebanon. And one of the driving factors was the concern that Hezbollah would be able to attack Israel in the same kind of attack uh, you saw from Hamas about a year ago. So clearing that area uh, 
of of Hezbollah's fighters is its immediate uh, immediate objective. It's not going to be able to do anything about Hezbollah's ability to launch missiles from farther away up the valley uh, from areas closer to Syria. Uh, that will probably continue. But in the, the immediate aftermath of Israel's assault on southern Lebanon, there will be a diminution of the possibility of Hezbollah's attacking Israel on the ground. I want to ask you about that bit of a video message we just saw there in that piece that just aired a moment ago where Prime Minister Netanyahu is directly addressing Iranians and saying there is nowhere in the Middle East beyond Israel's reach. How do you take that? Do you anticipate that to mean that there could be more direct attacks between Israel and Iran as this conflict continues? Well, it's certainly a warning to Iran that it, it better not meddle directly in what's going on uh, between Israel and Iran's proxies. And for their part, Iran is and ought to be uh, very much worried that it will it will endanger itself by attacking Israel directly. Um, it, it is likely uh, that they will not, that they will stand by. Iran is playing the long game. We have to remember that one of the things Iran is trying to do and has been trying to do is to buy time against Israel and its allies by developing nuclear weapons and to the extent that it can continue to do so without any interference, it will continue to play the long game, supporting its proxies uh, to attack Western interests, but not endangering itself by attacking Israel directly. All right. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thanks as always. Appreciate your expertise. You bet. Well, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and Minnesota Governor Tim Walz are locking horns tonight in the first and only vice presidential debate of the election campaign. The clash comes as former President Trump and VP Harris focus their attention on the response to Helene. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more. Good morning to you. President Biden will tour the disaster zone by air tomorrow. He has been in touch with the governors across the affected states. But beyond the physical and emotional toll in this campaign season, these crises really can raise questions about competence. And former President Trump quickly tried to capitalize on the dire situation, infuriating President Biden with his false claims about the administration's response. Ahead of tonight's vice presidential debate, it's the hurricane recovery effort that's front and center. Vice President Harris at FEMA headquarters after canceling campaign events out west, promising to help the storm's victims no matter how long it takes. Okay. I plan to be on the ground as soon as possible, but as soon as possible without disrupting any emergency response operations. Former President Trump arriving in Georgia with the Christian humanitarian relief organization Samaritan's Purse, trying to make a political issue out of the federal government's response. They're not being responsive. The federal government is not being responsive. The former president falsely claiming President Biden had refused to get on the phone with elected officials like Georgia's Republican Governor Brian Kemp. Both the White House and Kemp say the two leaders spoke the night before. He just said, hey, what do you need? He offered that if there's other things we need, just to call him directly, which I appreciate that. A furious President Biden says Trump is making things up. He's lying. And the governor told him he was lying. I don't care about what he says about me, but I care what he, what he communicates to the people the, that are in need. It comes as Trump and Harris's running mates, J.D. Vance and Tim Walls, are gearing up for their first and only debate in perhaps the biggest make-or-break moment of their political careers. Walls wrapping up debate prep in Michigan, first-term Senator Vance arriving in New York Monday. And though Trump has refused Vice President Harris's invitation for another presidential debate, saying overnight he could be open to more. I would love to have two or three more debates. I like it. I enjoy it. But it is so rigged and so stacked. As for the debate tonight, this is going to be the first time the two candidates have ever met in person. It has the potential for some fireworks. They have been sniping at one another for months from afar, keeping that traditional running mate role as the attack dog. One key voter group that both campaigns have been targeting here is men, with Vance and Walls at the forefront of that fight. And because Trump has not agreed to another debate with Harris, this could be the last word on the major stage, on any major stage, before Election Day. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you very much. And you can check out tonight's VP debate right here on NBC and NBC News Now. Special coverage begins at 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 Pacific.
Well, there's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including the life and lasting legacy of baseball legend Pete Rose, who passed away yesterday at the age of 83. But first, after the break, new claims surrounding Queen Elizabeth's final months coming from Britain's former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. More on her alleged secret battle with cancer next. Former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is speaking out for the first time about the possible cause of death of Queen Elizabeth. In an excerpt from his memoir that's set to be released this month, he claims the monarch had boat cancer. International correspondent Kelly Cobier joins us now from Buckingham Palace with more on this. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yes, Prime, uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson claims that he was told that information uh, about the Queen and then went on to detail what he said was his final meeting with her two days before her death. As Prime Minister, Boris Johnson was often by Queen Elizabeth's side. I was supposed to be looking as if you're enjoying it. Yes. <laughs> now, revealing intimate details about the last time he saw her. In his memoir, Unleashed, claiming he'd known for more than a year that she had a form of bone cancer, and her doctors were worried that at any time she could enter a sharp decline. Adding, in his final meeting with Queen Elizabeth, she seemed pale and more stooped, and she had dark bruising on her hands and her wrists. Those bruises seen in this final photo of the monarch as she waited to welcome the new prime minister, Liz Truss. But her mind, Johnson wrote, was completely unimpaired. She still flashed that great white smile in its sudden mood-lifting beauty. The palace not commenting on the claims and did not disclose any illness at the time. The queen died two days after their meeting. She was 96, her death certificate listing old age as the official cause of death. We've had no confirmation from Buckingham Palace that the Queen did indeed have bone cancer, but we have heard these rumours before. The Queen's oldest son, King Charles, now being treated for an unspecified form of cancer, making the announcement in February. A month later, Kate, the Princess of Wales, went public with her chemotherapy treatment, now completed. The King's youngest son, Prince Harry, in London Monday for a charity event honouring children with serious illnesses. As a parent, I know a little about the emotional roller coaster of parenting. But when I hear about the care that many of you mums, dads, and family members provide, the level of round the clock care that you offer, the skills you've had to learn, and the battles for support that fight every single, you fight every single day, I am truly in awe. Harry spending time with the children and their parents Monday at a hotel just two miles from Buckingham Palace. And it's not clear how long Prince Harry planned to stay here in the UK. No details on any, any potential meeting with his father, King Charles, either. His team told our partners at Sky News that they don't comment on his travel plans or on family matters. And as for that memoir by Boris Johnson, he also said in it that he had known uh, that the Queen had known all summer that she was going, in his words, but was determined to hang on and do her last duty by overseeing the peaceful transfer of power uh, between prime ministers. Uh, Buckingham Palace has said that they don't comment on these types of claims or on books in general. They said they, that shouldn't be taken as either confirmation or denial of those claims. Joe. All right, Kelly, thank you. Coming up, a multi-million dollar payout that's landing the FBI back in the spotlight this morning. After the break, we're going to dig into the dozens of allegations of gender discrimination at the Bureau's Training Academy and the massive settlement that's now headed before a judge. We'll be right back. We're back now with a look at the class action lawsuit against the FBI on sexual discrimination that's now led to a $22 million settlement with the Department of Justice. The DOJ reached the settlement with 34 women who allege they were wrongfully singled out for dismissal from the FBI's training academy in Virginia because of their gender. The settlement comes five years after the women originally filed the lawsuit. For more, we are joined by NBC News senior investigative producer Sarah Fitzpatrick. Sarah, good morning. So uh, the settlement still subject to approval by a federal judge, but if it does get approved, would rank among the biggest lawsuit settlements in the history of the Bureau. Walk us through how we got to this point. 
Absolutely. So this settlement is many, many years in the making. It started over six years ago when a small group of women from one class of FBI trainees were all dismissed, or many of them were dismissed under almost identical circumstances. And they decided that they needed to do something about it. They made spreadsheets, they collected documentation, and they worked really hard over time to convince dozens of other women to come forward with their stories of what they believed to be discrimination. And eventually they had enough evidence to file a class action lawsuit that demonstrated this was not just a pattern but perhaps the norm. NBC News first broke this news in 2019 and that led to the Department of Justice Inspector General launching a pretty wide-ranging investigation which independently found significant evidence of gender discrimination and other issues with how women were being treated at the FBI's training academy. For example, women accounted for 46% of all the trainees dismissed from the academy over a five-year period, even though they represented just 25% of the entire group. But even after that report was released in 2022, it took two more years of litigation to finally come to a place where the FBI was willing to discuss a settlement, in part to prevent this case from going to trial. So, I mean, Sarah, the payout will go to 34 women who are dismissed from the FBI's training academy, but that's not the only provision of the settlement. What can you tell us about that? That's right. The hardest fought and perhaps the most significant aspect of this settlement was there an agreement that two outside experts are going to review the evaluation process and ensure that women and men do not face any discrimination, that it is truly fair for everyone going forward. The 34 women who were part of this lawsuit, they're also going to have the opportunity to continue training to become FBI agents if they want to. And if they pass, they're going to have guaranteed placement at one of their preferred field offices, which is a provision designed to prevent any kind of further discrimination or retaliation for coming forward with their stories and making the settlement possible. What are we hearing from both the FBI and these women now? So the FBI told us in a statement yesterday that their people are their greatest assets and that they plan, they have put in significant training, evaluations, and they've taken lots of steps to prevent this from happening again. And those, some of those steps have been made in this five-year period. The women that we've spoken to, for some of them, this, re this settlement comes too little too late. They've already had to move on to other careers, and they're never going to be able to go back and become agents. But for some of these women, they plan to go back and try again, and they hope that they will be able to fully become agents and that generations of women after this settlement will have that same opportunity. All right, Sarah Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. Now to a story about two men and a quest for truth and justice. One who spent more than 20 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. The other, a journalist who would not let the case go. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt was in court to witness the final chapter. It would be impossible to return to John Adrian Velasquez all that has been taken from him. But in a Manhattan courtroom, a judge finally gave him back his good name. His decades-long cries for justice after being wrongfully convicted of killing a retired police officer coming down to a four-minute long proceeding. The people um, do not believe they are in a position to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Without so fanfare or apology, the judge formally accepting the conclusion of a Manhattan district attorney's internal investigation, the same office that once helped put him in prison, that J.J. Velasquez, as he is known, is an innocent man. I am granting that application, so this matter is dismissed. J.J.'s family and friends following him to a nearby park where he sat down with me for the first time untethered to the criminal justice system. Your name, you got your name back. I think people maybe don't appreciate how important that is. Absolutely. I mean, when we're born, our name becomes our identity. And so when we're taken through the system, they strip you of your identity. They put you in a shower, butt naked, hose you down like a slave. And then they give you a number and brand you. And that wasn't who I was. And I've been fighting for 27 years to tell them that my name is John Adrian J.J. Velasquez. Velasquez has been physically free since 2021, when then New York Governor Andrew Cuomo commuted his sentence, <laughs> granting him parole, but leaving him stained with the mark of a convicted felon. I had curfew. I couldn't travel out of the state without permission. 
If I wanted to go out on a date, I needed permission. Also there to witness his exoneration today, Dateline producer Dan Slepian, whose dogged 22-year pursuit of the truth in J.J.'s case began with a series of prison letters he received from J.J. I can go on and on about this miscarriage of justice. What did that mean to you to have someone listen to you? Well, besides my mother, Dan's my hero. Everybody knows that. Like, if it wasn't for Dan, I'd still be sitting in the cage. Well, Dan, every time we've talked about the story, you said you're not advocating for J.J. You're advocating for the truth. Did the truth prevail today? Yeah, the truth finally did prevail today. But frankly, everybody knew the truth for a very, very long time. And it took a long time for the court to finally recognize it. The DA's review of J.J.'s conviction looked at several factors, including recanted eyewitness testimonies and DNA evidence. J.J.'s case, one of several wrongful conviction cases unearthed by Slepian, recounted in his book, The Sing Sing Files. It's the cases undiscovered that haunt both men. You feel that you left a lot of innocent guys behind when you left prison? I know I left a lot of innocent people behind. It's that common? It's very common. Working on their behalf, J.J.'s mission as he moves forward and catches his breath for the first time in a very long time. Does the world feel a little different now? Definitely does. I can feel the, the air is like cleaner for me. And I just like, I feel different. Our thanks to Lester mm. for that report and to Dan for all his incredible efforts oh, over the years. Absolutely. Coming up, we are remembering a baseball icon this morning. After the break, the life and legacy of Pete Rose, undoubtedly one of the sport's most complicated and polarizing players. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Let's get you some financial headlines. New this morning, Boeing is looking to Wall Street to raise some cash. CNBC Savannah now has that and other money headlines. Savannah, good morning. Hey, Jeffy Savannah, good morning to you. So Boeing is reportedly considering raising at least $10 billion by selling new shares of stock. Now, the company is looking to replenish its cash reserves that have been impacted further by the strike of more than 30,000 factory workers. Bloomberg says a stock sale won't likely happen for about a month, assuming Boeing can resolve the strike and it can get a firm grasp on the financial toll of the walkout, which has halted production on the 30, 737 MAX and other top-selling planes. CVS Health is reportedly reviewing options, including a possible breakup of its retail and insurance units. The struggling healthcare services provider is looking to turn around its fortunes as it faces pressure from investors. CVS is also discussing whether its pharmacy benefits manager business, which oversees drug benefits for health plans, should be housed within the retail unit or under insurance. Such a move would essentially undo the company's $70 billion takeover of Aetna in 2017. And Airbnb is offering you the chance to be royalty for a night. The house featured in the 1984 Prince film Purple Rain is now listed to rent on the platform. The two-story home in Minneapolis has rooms that have been restored to capture their likeness on the screen. Others have been converted into museum-like exhibits with Prince memorabilia. And there's also a lounge where you can play guitar, drums, or an upright piano. There will be 25 nightly stays available between late October and mid-December for $7 a night. Wow. That is cool. Really cool that? would be if you could do Very Paisley, cool, right? Paisley Park. That would be really <laughs> neat. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> These thematic homes that they do are pretty cool for them. I know. They're out. so yeah, for big cool. Yeah, to, like, yeah. immerse yourself. So, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Sure. All right, grab your cowboy hats and saddle up. After the break, we're taking you to the pristine prairies of South Dakota for a jaw-dropping look at a storied tradition that'll have you saying Buffalo MG, get it? <laughs> Stay with us, it's up next. Welcome back in Sydney, Australia. Eager foodies and influencers waited in line for almost an hour to try American crumble cookies, you might have had them, at a new pop-up. A TikTok announcing the cookies were finally coming to Australia went viral, but when fans showed up, their dreams 
crumbled because they discovered the pop-up was charging about 12 bucks per cookie, and some complained that they even tasted stale. In a statement responding, the organizers said the pop-up never claimed to be official. They had spent thousands on flying the cookies in from the U.S., and the snacks had been kept fresh according to instructions. I don't know. Do you think people knew it was a rogue it was a rogue cookie pop-up? I have no idea, but we have one in my neighborhood, and I would not wait more than, like, five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Stale. Ugh. All right. Finally, this hour, tens of thousands of people from across the country came together in South Dakota recently for a decades-old tradition. Reporter Aaron Fight with our NBC affiliate in Rapid City got up early with the masses for the 60th annual Governor's Bison Roundup. 1,300 bison rolled through Custer State Park, shaking the earth as cowboys from across the region rounded them up. The park is home to one of the largest bison herds in the world. You know, the Buffalo Roundup would happen regardless if we had people coming or not. I think what's special is everybody getting together to watch this event. We're all out here in the prairie early in the morning. The excitement's high and it's just feeding off each other to get to watch a really unique event to South Dakota. Spectators watched just a few hundred feet away, many traveling across the country and even farther to watch this once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. Well, we hear so much hype about the Roundup. It's like people say it's the greatest thing they've experienced, so we want to make sure before we get sick that we get, get to do it. We've talked to quite a few of the people here. A lot of them are their first times here like us. The bison herd is all being moved to corrals to be sorted, branded, tested, and treated which doesn't make logistics for an event like this any easier. It takes a lot to put an event like this. Um, we have over 200 volunteers, staff, seasonals um, that all come together. So coordinating everybody from law enforcement to medical to parking, um, just about everyone, uh, making sure we're on the same page and making the experience well, uh, good for everybody. Even for the people who are coming back every year, there is something new they notice. I'm always surprised when I take pictures and I can see the, the bison with their tongue sticking out. <laughs> they're hot. <laughs> they're very warm when they're out there running so hard. Although many people were amazed by the bison, many others were shocked by the sheer number of people who came out for the roundup. I would say, like, the amount of people that come here, it's, like, shocking once you get in the park. Like, the line is really long to get into the park. We came at about 5, and we were a mile to the gate, and... It's a mile of cars, one hour, you know, before they open up. An animal that thousands came to see at this unbelievable Buffalo Roundup. Mm. Incredible visual there. Just don't wow. get in their way. No kidding. Our thanks to Aaron Fight for that report. Okay, just before we end the hour, we do have some exciting news. We wanted to introduce you to the latest member of the Morning News Now family. Congratulations oh. to our technical director, Laurel, and her husband, Dylan, who have <laughs> just welcomed a beautiful oh. baby girl. This is Lillian May Schley. She was born on September 27th, weighing 7 pounds, 11 ounces. <laughs> We're sending the family all of our love. We miss oh, Laurel, we but do. we want her to spend all the time in the world. Yes, take it. Girl. Oh, congratulations, Lillian. What a gorgeous name, and she's just perfect. That yeah. is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.